of stuff there, isn't it? The, the humongous, the very small, everything in between. And I love that video. It's, it's good to just, for me, it's just good to see it every once in a while and, re, and be reminded of the, the vastness of creation. It is so enormous. And it's the reminder of even when God says in Isaiah, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so are my ways higher than yours. It's pretty high up there, which should tell us something about our own understanding. Today we're going to start our series in Genesis. So you should be able to find Genesis in your Bible. It's the very first book, uh, and we're, we're going really far in it today. Verses 1 and 2. Before we start, let me pray for us. God, in all these things, we're reminded of your amazing creation. We are so little and seemingly insignificant next to who you are. And yet you give us value, not because of who we are, but because of you. May we remember that. May we focus on you. Help us to love us, to help us to love you more when we leave than we did when we walked in because we know you more. Amen. All right, so today we're starting Genesis. And, you know, I got to tell you, when, when we had first thought about doing Genesis, I had this whole thing in my mind of, all right, here's how the first week would go. Here's how the second week would go. Here's how the third week and so on. And, and I got to tell you that today was probably the most difficult sermon I maybe have ever had to prepare. And you may be wondering why, and, and I'll get to that. But first, my original sermon that I prepared today simply went through the narrative of chapter one. Here's what happened in creation, and here's how you can see redemption in creation. Or know that creation is the foundation of the redemptive plan. The, the whole redemptive story, redemption, is seen in creation, and, and that may seem a little bit odd. Since in creation, everything was good. In fact, in, in creation, everything was very good. And so if everything was very good, there was no need for redemption. If there's no need for redemption, then, then how can creation be the foundation of the redemptive story? Ephesians 1, 4 says that God chose us before the foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. So hear that. Before anything was created, God had chosen those whom he would redeem. Paul's words, not mine. Before the foundation of the world. The moment time began, redemption was already in his mind. So before anything happened, before he said, let there be, before he formed the heavens and the earth. If there was a before, before time, I don't know how that works. He had creation, he had redemption in mind. The fall was not an accident. And hear that very plainly. The fall of Adam and Eve was not an accident. It's not something that God didn't know would happen. He knew it would happen. In fact, in Revelation 13.8 it says... And all who dwell on the earth will worship the beast, everyone whose name was not written before the foundation of the world in the book of the Lamb who was book of life of the Lamb who was slain. You see that? Be, before the foundation of the world was the book of the Lamb who was slain. Before the foundation of the world, creation is the stage on which redemption happens. It's where his redemptive acts, his his crucifixion, his resurrection, and his grace and his mercy are revealed. And Jesus is the redeemer, but he's also the agent of creation. He's the one through whom creation was made. Colossians 1.16 says, For by him, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible, invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authority, all things were created by him and for him. 
He's the redeemer and he's the creator. Hebrews 1-2 says, But in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he created the world. Jesus is the redeemer and he's, he's the creator. And so it's logical to think that because he was the lamb who was slain before the foundation of the world, he has, he has chosen his people before the foundation of the world. Creation was made with all of that in mind. Creation, again, is the stage on which redemption happens. And this will be our focus throughout the whole series in Genesis. How do you see redemption? We will see glimpses of the pre-incarnate Jesus. We will see times where Jesus actually appears to people before he is fully human. We will see aspects of Jesus, aspects of who he is show up here and there in Genesis. We will see the faith of the Old Testament saints as they hoped for the Redeemer who would come, the one who would make all things right. So the main reason why it was difficult for, for today is, one, all of the controversies surrounding the creation narrative in the early parts of Genesis. I don't know if you are aware of this, but there's a lot of debate on in and outside of the church on whether or not it was seven actual days or seven ages or there's all kinds of controversy surrounding this. And so the question that I wrestled with was how much of this controversy should I address? My job our job as the church is to equip you, the saints, for the work of the ministry. This means that, that I, that we, need to prepare you for the conversations, for the questions that you may have or may be asked by others. And to do so with the word of God. And this is where the difficulty comes in. Because we can't avoid addressing the difficult topics. We can't say, well, there's so much unknown in creation, let's just avoid it. Let's just gloss over it. No, we have to address it, because that is the equipping part. So we address it, because it's the Word of God. It is the inspired Word of God, and we cannot shy from it. Second, it is the foundation of everything we believe. Without Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, same story from different perspective, nothing else makes sense. It truly is the foundation. And so as I was thinking about needing to equip, I realized that my first sermon draft fell short of equipping. And so I redid it. And then I redid it again. And then yesterday, I redid it again. And so, um, hopefully by the grace of God, we got somewhere. <laughs> In our day, there seems to be a discrepancy between science and the Word of God. And when I say in our day, this is actually the way that it's been since the Bible was written. So it's not anything new. But I want to tell you before we go any further that I want you to know that that's not accurate. There is no discrepancy between science and the Bible. There is zero discrepancy. This is a statement made by unbelievers who cannot accept Scripture and therefore will not believe it. And so what happens is they look for things and interpret things in a way to try to disprove the Bible. They will never submit to Scripture, but they will never succeed. The Bible will never be proven to be wrong. There are some who claim that the Bible says the earth is 6,000 years old. But I bet very few can back that claim up. How do we get there? How do we get to that age? How do you... Where does it say that? The Bible does not say when the earth was created. The Bible does not say how old the earth is. It never gives us the age. It... it never tried to answer this question. Remember, this, this book, Genesis, was originally written for the Israelites as they were leaving Egypt, going to the promised land. It was never... It, 
they never were concerned about how old the earth was. It wasn't a question that they were debating. Moses and Aaron were not sitting around the fire saying, well, I wonder how old the earth is. Like, that wasn't what they were ever addressing. Why is this important? Because we cannot read into the text what we want it to answer. We can't go to Genesis and say, all right, I want to know how old the earth is. So I'm going to look in the Bible, in Genesis, to see how old the earth is. It was never written for that purpose. And so we must listen to what it's actually telling us. We cannot force it to answer questions that it never answered. Have you ever had a conversation with somebody, and as you're talking, they just are ready to pounce with the answer or with their point? They're not listening to what you're saying. They're not, I mean, if you're married, you've had this type of conversation. Melissa does it to me all the time. That's a joke. It's actually the other way around. Um, but as you're, as you're having these conversations, the person isn't listening. Or you're not listening. You're just ready to, to say the next point. And this is what we do with Scripture. And these conversations are rarely, if ever, productive. What's the Bible's purpose? What is the specific book's purpose? What is Genesis's purpose? What is it telling us? This is where we need to focus. This is what we need to understand, because if we don't, we'll lose sight of what it's actually telling us. Now, that being said, the way that we interpret Scripture is very important. It is telling us things, and it is possible to do mathematics and get to an idea of how old the earth is. Right? It's not just some made-up thing. It is possible to do that. Remember, it's not telling us that, but we have to understand the interpretation of Scripture. How do, we, how do we do this? Many, in their interpretation of Scripture, make Scripture bow to science. I had a professor who said, we have two revelations. We have the, the Bible and we have science. And so you have to understand science and then make the Bible kind of subservient to science. First, I mean, there's a big problem with this, right? And understand that. Scripture bows to nobody and to nothing. Scripture does not bow. It is the word of God, and all bow before him. God wrote the Bible, and God created science. So if there's a discrepancy between the Bible and science, it's because we are misinterpreting one or both of them. If science is saying that this part of the Bible is not right, we are either misunderstanding science or we are misunderstanding the Bible. One of the two. Because it does not contradict each other because God is the author of both. We have to grasp that. The Bible is the word of God and it stands alone. We can, however, use science to help us to understand Scripture, but even this is dangerous. Know that there is nothing that is totally objective. There is nothing in science, there is nothing anywhere that is totally objective. Well, facts are objective, right? Yes, but facts are subjective, but the, the interpretation of those facts is not. It's subjective. Every fact is interpreted by someone to mean something. And do not think for one instance that those who refuse to believe in God will interpret something to support the idea of God. They will not. They are opposed to God and they don't want him to exist. And therefore, they will interpret what they understand to show that God is not there. Every bit of fact has multiple potential interpretations. Who are we listening to? Also know that science is not concrete. It changes over time. As more and more things are learned and discovered, the, the way that we interpret facts is changed. It adapts. This is what science is supposed to do. You, you see something, you build a hypothesis, and then you look at the facts to say whether or not that hypothesis is, is supported. And when new facts are figured out, it's adjusted. 
An example of this is for, for thousands of years, science taught that there was no beginning to the earth. It was eternal. And actually, the, the Bible was mocked. How can the Bible say that the earth was created, that the universe was created? It's eternal. And it wasn't until around the 1800s that science looked, scientists looked at, at the universe and said, there was a beginning point. And in that moment, science and the Bible actually went like this because science learned more that the Bible was actually right. Scientists have now spent time since then, in the last 150 so years, trying their hardest to minimize that affirmation that science had of Scripture. There are two main understandings in regarding creation. First is the old earth. The universe is billions of years old. The earth is somewhere in there. And there's many sub-beliefs under this heading. But the main idea is that the days of creation are not actual days, they're ages, they're eons of time. You also then have the young earth, which says that God created in six actual days and then rested on the seventh. This takes the Bible literally for what it says. And as a result, we end up with a universe that is less than 10,000 years old. And this is, this is where the problem comes in. But know this, you can be an old earth person or a young earth person and both be in the kingdom of God. This is the glorious thing. This is not something that our salvation rests on whether or not you interpret Genesis as a young earth or an old earth. But also know that depending on how you interpret creation, it will impact the way that you interpret the rest of Scripture. It has to. When Scripture and science disagree, I will tell you that we, especially going through Genesis, will always side with Scripture. It is the Word of God, and we will always side with it. Also know that there are a number of things that we believe that are scientifically impossible. <clears throat> Absolutely impossible. It is not possible for somebody to walk on water. It is not possible for somebody to feed 5,000 or 4,000 people with a few fish and a few loaves of bread. It is not possible for somebody, we know, it is not possible for somebody to be born from a virgin. It is not possible scientifically for somebody to raise from the dead. Like There are some things fundamental in our faith that science can fully prove cannot happen. We cannot bow to what science says. This does not mean that we are anti-science. It means that we believe in a God who transcends all things and is able to do anything he wants. I remember a conversation I had a while back with a friend. We were walking and looking at the stars, and he said, hey, that star, I'm, I'm making this up, he said a star is, is a million light years away. And so because the star is a million light years away and we can see the star, it, therefore that means that the earth is at least a million years old. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to see the star. And I understand this argument, but from a Christian, it's flawed. Other arguments for an old earth are the scientific way of dating materials. We look at, at the way that science dates materials and says, well, this says that this is 200 million years old, and therefore we have to be at least 200 million years old. Again, I understand the argument, but from a Christian, it's flawed. How does the Bible answer these two questions? It doesn't. Hear this, it, it doesn't answer these questions. Again, the Bible doesn't tell us if the earth is old or young. However, these two arguments and others like them are faulty ways of thinking. See, this assumes, one, that we know and understand fully how everything works. And so the way that we date material is always accurate. It's a big assumption. Secondly, it assumes that God created everything at the age of zero. It's very possible 
that God said, let there be stars, and there were stars, and he made the stars visible on earth. Right? This isn't rocket science, if you will. God can do anything he wants. God is not bound by the laws of nature he created. He could have created the rocks with characteristics of being old. I mean, the list goes on. The reason that people believe that the Bible tells us the earth is young is that early in Genesis, we are given a genealogy. And we'll look at the genealogy in a couple of weeks, but if you do the math, it gives us a young earth. And so because of this, people will often interpret the, you either have the days, which is, again, the young earth, or you have ages or eons, which is the old earth. And so there's arguments for both, right? There are difficulties on both sides. Know that, that the Hebrew word for day is straightforward, yom. It's, it means day. Like, it's not, it's, it's not a convoluted word. It says day, and then it says there was evening and morning the first day, the second day, and so on. Furthermore, the idea of Sabbath rest is based on the fact that God rested on the seventh day. And so to interpret the day as an age, something other than 24 hours, creates issues with this Sabbath rest. Yet there was also evening and mornings on days one, two, and three before the sun was made. How's that? Something we'll talk about. On the other hand, if each day is an eon of time, how can we explain the fact that there was vegetation well before there was sun? Or how was there death before the fall of man? Or how, how is it that dinosaurs lived hundreds of millions of years ago and humans have appeared 200,000 years ago and the Bible says that both were made on the sixth day? There's a lot of issues we go through, this was not an exhaustive conversation. So if, if you came today hoping that I would answer all the questions, um, you're going to leave disappointed. This was a cursory look at the issues in Genesis and why I had the difficulties. And so as we look at a few of these difficulties, I want to give you a foundation of sorts of, of where we're going, of how we're going to proceed through Genesis. First, words have meaning. And when words are put together, they convey a meaning. They convey something that, that is being told. And so there's reasons why Moses, through the Holy Spirit, wrote what he did. And if something has a plain meaning, it will get its plain meaning. As we go through Genesis, if something has a plain meaning, we will base everything on the fact that that's its meaning. And this is... Maybe this is something from my legal background. If, if a law has a plain understanding when you read it, then that's its meaning. If Scripture tells us something, if Scripture says day, I'm going with what it says. That's just kind of the foundation of where we're going. Some things, however, are clearly meant to be allegorical, and some things are not. Regardless of how or when God created we have to remember its purpose. Its purpose in telling us that God created is that God created. That's its purpose. It is not there to tell us how old it is or even how. We must remember the fact that God created the heavens and the earth. All of creation belongs to him. There is no other. Remember that, again, when Genesis was written, the Israelites were leaving Egypt. They were going to the promised land. There was a common belief at the time. And this belief was that every nation had its own God. And its own God is the one that protected them. And so if, if another nation came, it was really up to the two gods to determine who was better. It wasn't about human strength. It was about divine protection. And so when they're getting ready to go into Canaan, they are... They are facing the gods of the Canaanites versus their god. We see a glimpse of this in, Gen in Exodus during the plagues. Because every plague that, that God did against the Egyptians was really attacking one of the Egyptian gods. Showing that Yahweh is supreme. That Yahweh is the one who is in control of all things. 
And so God is setting this up saying, Israelites, you see, so you're going to the promised land, but you see everything there is. All the stars that you can see from the sky to everything that is on the earth, I made. I am supreme. You do not have to fear any of these other so-called gods that are around. I am supreme. Now, there are also a lot of ideas on how the earth was created. And some of these are very fascinating. The, the good gods and the bad gods were fighting each other, and, and one created everything to kind of stick it to the other one, and it's a mess. It's an absolute mess. Everything was created by fighting. And God is setting this apart and saying, listen, I made it, and it was very good. I made it. It's mine. You don't have to fear any of these other gods. One of the main objectives in creation narrative in Genesis was telling the Israelites that Yahweh is supreme. He made everything and everything belongs to him. So if God wants to give the Israelites land, it's his to give. He owns it because he made it. The creation narrative was not given to answer questions of how he created or when he created. It was to tell us that he did create. We have to remember that. So today we're going to look at the first two verses of Genesis. Understanding these, the context of these two verses is vital to understanding the rest of Scripture. It's vital to understanding the, our faith. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. We could spend, literally, we could spend weeks in this single verse. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. In the beginning. The beginning of what? The beginning of everything. The beginning of time. The beginning of space. The beginning of, of physical things. The beginning of, of humanity. The beginning of everything. If you trace everything back, it has a beginning. In the beginning, before this moment, there was no time, there was no place, there was no space, there was no nothing that we could fathom. The triune God was in perfect harmony with himself before this moment. And this is why we can say that God transcends time. He's omnichronos. He's everywhere at once. He's omnipresent. He's, he's all-powerful. He's omnipotent. He knows everything. He's omniscient. Why? Because he made it all and he transcends all of it. He's not bound by creation. He created creation. In the beginning, in the beginning what? Or in the beginning, in the beginning who? In the beginning God. He is the subject of this passage. He is the subject of scripture. Scripture is about God. It is not about you. It is not about me. Like, get this. None of us are the heroes of this story. None of us are the ones who are going to come and save the day. It is about God. He is a subject. In the beginning, God. It's all about him. He is the one who gives value to everything. He made it. He has the final say. As we'll see in a few weeks... In Genesis 3, the human response then and ever since then has been to try to take this authority away from God and to claim it for ourselves. We want to be the ones who get to say what's valuable. We want to be the ones who get to say what's right and wrong. We want to be the ones who control it. We want to be the final arbiters of everything, from humanity to desires to creation itself. So when we understand Genesis 1-1, we understand that all value comes from him. Everything has value because of him. To claim value in something other than what he has said is actually living in rebellion against him. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. All that we see, all that we know, all that we can explore... All things have a beginning except for God himself. He is the one who could create with a word. 
I love one of the, one of the ways that, that man is made in God's image, which we'll get to later. But one of the ways is, is we are creative. We create things. We design things. I love looking at some art. Some of it I don't understand, but some of it I really like. Music. You name it. We are creative. Architecture. Yet every time we create, we need some raw materials. We need something. Humans have an e amazing ability to create, but we cannot create out of nothing. Only God can do that. He creates out of nothing. In the beginning, God created all there is. Other than God himself, everything has a beginning and was created by his word. Look at verse 2. And the earth was without form, and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. There's a lot here, too. Notice first the Spirit of God. In the first two verses in the book of Genesis, the first two, book, the first two verses in the Bible, we already see the triune God working together. The Spirit of God is hovering over the water. So what's going on here? God could have created everything at once. God could have said, let there be creation. And all the seven days of creation happened immediately. He did not need to divide it up, but he, he chose to. And remember, God is communicating things to us through Scripture. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and the earth was without form. Without form. The, God created the heavens and the earth, and it was chaotic. It was, it was not organized. It was not put together. It was without form. It was void. In the Hebrew way of thinking, water often represents chaos. It, something that needs to be tamed. And so you see the, the spirit was hovering over the face of the waters. This is communicating that God triumphs over all chaos. There is nothing that God cannot overcome. There is nothing that God cannot redeem. In essence, this is saying something like, in the beginning, God set the raw materials in place. The substance of the universe was in place, but not yet formed. It was chaotic. We cannot fully understand what this means, but what we know is it's communicating to us. I mean, think of... An artist with a blank canvas. Canvas and paint, it's all there. But it's not organized in a way that is actually something beautiful. Think of a, an artist with, or a sculptor with a, a block of clay. It's there. And you hear sometimes the artist say, well, it's, it's in there. You just got to get it out. My mind doesn't work like that. And it's never come out. But this is God. He's saying... In the beginning, I made the heavens and the earth, and it, was without, it wasn't organized yet. What that looked like, I have no idea. I'm just telling you what it says. The Spirit hovered over the water. The same word hovered is used in the Old Testament to describe a mother eagle hovering over her children, over her eaglets, over her young, to protect them, to nurture them. This is what it's telling us. This is what the Spirit is doing in creation. It all seemed chaotic, and the Spirit of God was hovering and protecting and forming and nurturing. Remember that Scripture uses words and descriptions that, that we can understand to tell us the truth that we would not necessarily be able to grasp. How often do you feel like in your life it's chaotic? Your situations, your world, the world... Anything else, it seems like it's chaotic. It seems like every day there's a tree that falls down at the Dolorado house. It's chaotic. Like, what is happening? Even in, even in all the midst of our of seeming chaos. I mean, think about the Israelites as they left Egypt. Everything seemed to be chaotic. They, they left everything they knew. They were being pursued, and God did amazing work. And we often think, 
man, that would be awesome to see. It would also be terrifying to see. The chaoticness of everything that they had experienced. They were told to go to a land that they don't know. It's inhabited by people bigger and stronger than them. Chaotic. And God is communicating to them, it's not, you need not worry. I am in control. Chaoticness does not exist. Hear that. There is nothing that is outside of God's control. God is not a God of chaos. He is a God of order. When it looks like something is chaotic, we are reminded that his spirit is here, protecting and nurturing us so we need not worry. This, brothers and sisters, is the point of the creation narrative. Not to tell us how old the earth is, but to tell us that, that there is nothing outside of his control. There is nothing that God doesn't know. There is no amount of seeming chaos that God cannot overcome. What a promise we have. What a hope that is given to us. In the beginning, God. And this is a reason for a glorious hope. 